I would like to start by uh, giving you a little bit of my background of intellectual, invo intellectual involvement in the issues of international monetary organization, because out of it comes a bias. You will see in a moment that this work could not have done anything but to create in me a, a bias towards a certain ways of looking at what's going on in the world. I should also say, as an introduction, that don't expect from me any predictions or forecasts of what is going to happen in Europe. Uh, nobody uh, in his right mind would expect that from me, and I'm sure none of you do. What I can do and what I will try to do is to put on perspectives which you don't find in the media, but they are firmly rooted in my own background. And for that purpose, I've done something you can't do in Parliament. I brought some props. In 1963, now, in 1958 to 62, I was at Yale, and one of my teachers was a man called Robert Triffin, a Belgian of uh, Harvard PhD, who uh, was the father of the European Payments Union, which was a forerunner of the European Economic Community. At the time, he had written a book called uh, Gold and the Dollar Crisis, which uh, developed what has become known as the Triffin Dilemma, a dilemma which showed that the post-war international monetary system could not persist. I don't have the time to go into this, but I just want to tell you that it awakened in me an interest that has lasted to today, and it got me here. When I got to Stanford for my teaching as, uh, assignment, I took an entrepreneurial step and put together all the articles written by, or most of the articles written by economists, bureaucrats, and politicians on how to fix the international monetary system that had evolved after Bretton Woods. And Stanford University Press was nice enough to publish all these articles in, in this book. It also came out in a Spanish uh, uh, translation. Uh, for me, as a young assistant professor, it was very exciting to find out that the Russians actually had a 10-page review of it. And so uh, I was very, very excited uh, that uh, these ideas uh, were around and everybody understood that reform was needed. Later on, I found out that uh, I was invited to... Uh, shucks, where is it? Somebody stole it. Uh, I, have a, I have a little penguin book. Oh, here it is. I was invited to write a pen, penguin book uh, called The International Monetary, Monetary System. It went through four editions, uh, translated into several languages, sold many thousands of copies. Somebody once told me that when he was in the US Treasury and saw, uh, he saw it on the desk of Paul Volcker. So, <laughs> not that it did do any good about it. <laughs> and then culminating uh, my interest, uh, of course, in between I had attended innumerable conferences on, on this issue where we chat with each other, gossip about, about all issues. I'm still going once a year to a conference organized by Robert Mundell in Siena, in Tuscany where he brings together people with interests like this. And the cost of admission to this conference is that we have to hear for another hour what Mandel's latest version is for an international, for global currency. Well, uh, uh, in 1999, when the euro was introduced, uh, the Fraser Institute was kind enough to publish a sort of study called The Case for the Amero, the Economics and Politics of a North American Monetary Union which is sort of the fruition of all of the things that I have learned and thought about in my previous engagements in this field. If you Google my name, you will see that uh, the international community credits me as being the father of the Amero, uh, a, a word which uh, actually my wife over dinner suggested, and she should get all the credit. Uh, but uh, around it is a very interesting development in recent years, namely that I, I was considered to be part of a global conspiracy to 
deprive the United States of its national sovereignty through the creation of a common currency in North America. Uh, uh, some uh, media type came and recorded uh, my response to these challenges, and it can also be found on the internet. It made no difference. They don't really want to know. They knew that there was a great conspiracy and uh, that I was in cahoots with governments to, 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 to get deprive the Americans of their sovereignty. Well, uh, I was very, very, so let me just say this. You can see that I have a lot of intellectual capital tied up in these ideas. So what I'm going to present now, I warn you, you have to discount them occasionally, especially if you don't agree with them, <laughs> that I am coming from a certain point of view. But as you all know, one has to have a point of view on almost anything. Otherwise, you don't see anything. If you don't have a perspective, you, you, you don't have a perspective, you can't see anything. So I'm going to present a point of view which I hope will help you understand what's going on and see the bigger picture. Let me go back a little bit on the intellectual history of the case for a common currency, the euro, which is the realization of that idea. When I was in Chicago, Milton Friedman had just published a path-breaking article, widely cited, on the merit of flexible exchange rates. Actually, he calls it freely floating exchange rates. At the same time, Robert Mundell, another colleague at the University of Chicago, had written a path-breaking article which is cited as having merited his Nobel Prize, in which he developed the concept of optimum currency areas. And let me tell you what the basic, simple idea is. Milton Friedman, in his article, simply said, look how wonderful the world would be if each country could just engage in monetary and fiscal policy to deal with prisoner cycles, random disturbances, and all kinds of other economic problems by using monetary and fiscal policy without having to worry about the exchange rate. Great idea. So Mandel said, all right, if that is such a great idea, let's think about a region in the United States that is in deep trouble. Lots of white hairs, you probably remember how bad the problem was in West Virginia, where uh, huge unemployment and industrial unrest was taking place because coal that they produced <coughs> from deep in ground had lost its appeal. Oil, gas, uh, uh, strip mining in Wyoming and so on, they were in just bad shape. So M Mand Mandel raises the interesting question. If flexible exchange rates are such a wonderful thing for countries to deal with problems like loss of competitiveness in all your main industry, coal in West Virginia, why don't we have West Virginia give it its own currency? And they could get out of this problem by using monetary and fiscal policy without any problems. Of course, when confronted with this reductio ad absurdum idea, most people say, oh, no, 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 no. I mean, flexible exchange, but flexible exchange for, for, uh, for West Virginia? No, 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 that's not what we're talking about. So I once asked Friedman, well, what is your response to Mandel on this? And I said, do you think that Panama should have its own currency? And as you well know, they don't have their own currency. They have dollars. They use dollars. And Friedman said, that's OK. Uh, I would have never recommended that Panama should have its own currency. But notice what that implies. That implies that he acknowledges the importance of the issue raised by Mandel. Namely, you cannot simply take one historically determined nation state and say, you should have your own currency and flexible exchange rates. 
Maybe, like Panama, they are of the right size or have other characteristics that would make it much better for the people of Panama to use the dollar. In other words, have a permanently fixed exchange or have a currency union between Canada and the United States. The irony is, of course, that people like Friedman, and including Martin Feldstein at Harvard, who are strong opponents to, up to, cur to currency unions and fixed exchange rates, are also very skeptical about the ability of monetary and fiscal policy to deal with these kinds of disturbances and business cycles. That's a very interesting irony. Nevertheless, this is how we, how we uh, uh, got going. And this concern about the ability of monetary and fiscal policy to stabilize economies underlies the views of so many people, very distinguished economists, who said, when negotiations and talks about the euro began, said, don't even talk about it. It's stupid. They are not an optimum currency area. It's not worth for them to do it. When the negotiations took place, oh, you know, you will find out when you talk about it that it just isn't feasible. When they decided to go ahead, they said, oh, you know, you're never going to implement it. Well, when they implemented it, they said, it's going to fail very soon. And, you know, it took 10 years, for 12 years, for uh, this problem to arise. And now they're all gloating. I get those emails saying, see, I predicted it. It's, it's like the people who uh, send out every week a, a letter predicting that the stock market would fall by 50% next week. And once, once it falls, then they pull out that email that they wrote the week before and say, see, I am clairvoyant. <laughs> OK. <coughs> what is the fundamental case for having the euro? And I think it's important for you to understand this because it helps you assess the probability that it will be dissolved, will go into crisis, or Greece will leave. The standard case is, and I put that in my Fraser Institute study, that it will save transactions costs. Those of you who travel in Europe welcome very much, if you remember the past, how much easier it is to go from country to country without having to have a bag full of different currencies. But that's, of course, relatively trivial. What is much more important is that in corporations and in banks, in the big office buildings in Western Europe, there used to be a whole floors occupied by highly people, highly paid people, highly skilled people, using very high-tech, expensive equipment to deal with the international currency implications of their normal activities, exports, imports, and all that. Those offices have shut down. Their business has decreased tremendously. The second benefit is, of course, that with lower transactions costs, you increase the level of trade, specialization, and productivity. But the one, which when I gave a talk about that in Mexico, I got a standing ovation with this promise. The currencies of individual, the interest rates on bonds issued by national governments carry an exchange risk premium. I was just in Mexico and I talked to people about this. They have interest rates on consumer loans that reflect the borrowing costs of their government, which carries several percentage points higher than is the US interest rate. Why is that? It's because lenders are worried that if they lend money to Mexican borrowers, <coughs> next day, Pre might come back in, in the next election, and they will go on their merry way of creating inflation and, and, and all kinds of disturbances that will lead to a collapse of the currency. Interestingly enough, and that's a real puzzle, now it's not really a, a puzzle, but a, a, an interesting phenomenon, that in spite of the excellent 
performance of the Mexican economy and their ability to keep prices stable, they still carry this exchange rate premium. Now, in fact, of course, in Greece, which had a big exchange rate premium on their interest rates, the formation of the euro eliminated it almost completely. But before I go there, let me tell you about one other benefit that I think is, in my view anyway, and in a much bigger perspective, one of the greatest advantages of having countries like Greece, Italy, and so on join the common currency. I was at a conference in Kiel, and there was a man called Niels Tigesen, a professor of economics at the University of Copenhagen. He had just come back from a, 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 a tour of European capitals where he had met with central bankers and politicians to discuss the feasibility of creating the euro. And he said they were universally positive. And why were they positive? They were positive because they believed that it would stop the vicious cycle that has gotten us into the serious difficulties in all of Western countries, including the United States and Canada. And what is that cycle? It's based on something called public choice theory, explained through public choice theory, which Milton Friedman called the Achilles heel of democracy. And you know what I'm talking about. We have a political system in which politicians can go out and say, elect me, you, the people who work for the Greek railroads. If you and your families vote for me, I will guarantee you retirement at age 45 at full pay. They get their support forever. If you increase spending to buy all kinds of interest schools, but you also introduce a lot of regulation. Well, increasing the spending uh, is the easiest part. And the big problem arises that these politicians had the opportunity to go and say, well, it doesn't matter that we don't have the revenue. We won't antagonize the other bunch of voters who are taxpayers. What we'll do is we'll just say, Whatever we're doing will raise our productivity so much and we will be so prosperous that tax revenues will go up without making any sacrifices and so on. And besides, we can always borrow the money and we owe it to ourselves. All these Keynesian slogans. <laughs> if it sounds familiar, that's exactly what it was. When I was running for the Reform Party, that's a story I got. Why are you guys so upset about the deficit in 1993? We owe it to ourselves. Gideon Rosenblut. Gideon Rosenblut, a, a, a diehard Keynesian from UBC, confronted me with this issue. I mean, it's just absolutely silly, but the, the, the public opinion was very much in favor of saying that this was correct. In other words, as it's now being phrased, politicians in the Western world have engaged in this terrible, terrible process of what they call kicking the can down <coughs> the road into the future. And to complete the analogy, what we problems we are facing now is that they hit the wall. The can can't be kicked down any further. That, I think, is one of the biggest problems, crises, our Western world is facing. It's a crisis in democracy. So where does the euro come in? Well, here's what happened in Greece. The Greek government politicians got re-elected by making all these promises. They didn't have the revenue, so they told the Bank of Greece, buy those bonds from us. And the Bank of Greece says, OK, but you know, you have to realize that that means we have to print the money, because we don't really just have the money. <laughs> we have to print it. 
And then we know from experience, the more money you print, the higher will be the inflation rate. So they gave these higher wages to these workers, but then you got inflation. And the worker said, oh, wait a minute, that wasn't part of the deal. I wanted a real increase in income, not one that gets eroded by inflation. So, okay, fine, we'll give you another pay increase. And we had a vicious cycle, which ultimately, all the time in the process, led to a depreciation of the Greek drachma. And I'm making up this number, but after the war, one Greek drachma was equal to one dollar. After all this process, it was worth only two cents because of this vicious process. It is also very, very destructive, especially the regulations accompanying all this buying of votes, because productivity was very low. Greece has very low per capita income. So here is where the politicians, in their rational and open moments, realize that they are caught in an insuperable dilemma. If they say, vote for me, we're going to stop this cycle and make sure that whatever increases in pay you get, we can pay for. There will be an opposition party or opposition parties which will say, these guys are short-sighted, don't uncaring, they are all kinds of nasty properties. Vote for us and we'll continue the way it is. So no political party in the Western world can essentially afford to do what is necessary. <coughs> but they also realized that if they no longer had under their thumb the Bank of Greece and tell the Bank of Greece, buy my bonds, that process would have to stop. So by giving up the sovereignty that came along with having an independent central bank and giving that sovereignty to the European Central Bank in Frankfurt, they would, in principle, stop this vicious cycle for the benefit of everyone. The European Central Bank, under the, on the assistance of Germany especially, <coughs> was by its constitution prohibited from printing money, buying bonds, except necessary to maintain price stability and the enough money to finance economic growth. The Germans had had their experience with hyperinflation in the, 20, in the 20s. They are so sensitive to this problem that they insisted this be in the constitution or we won't join, and the others went along. And I think some of them went along because they understood the issues that I have just raised. Now the big problem is, but how would the politicians in Greece react? Well, the theory is that if they continue with their ways, the private capital markets would punish them. The private capital markets, UBS, would say, no more of those bonds at the 1% above the Bundesbank rate, uh, the, 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 the Bunds, the German 10-year uh, bonds. You are running a deficit that's unsustainable. You are, we're, we're worried about you going bankrupt. We're going to charge you 9% instead of 7%. The capital markets never did. For years I've been asking bankers and experts and saying, why are the central bank, why are the private financial markets not putting out the signals that problems are almost as bad as they were before in Greece? Nobody has a definitive answer, but here's one that appeals to me the most, and that is the capital markets private capital markets often are irrational and have a certain culture and the culture said Greece is too big to fail and if we ever get to the point where this might happen we will 
have the European community in Brussels, the IMF, the European Central Bank in Frankfurt, bail them out. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is exactly what has been happening. That's a very pessimistic view. But now let me spin it. There is a very positive development accompanying it. And that is that the, that the lenders, IMF, European Central Bank, a special finance fund that has been created and all those kinds of details, insisting that Greece, you have to make the adjustments to prevent what has gotten you into this trouble or you won't get any more money. In other words, what we are seeing is a development which is equivalent to what we had expected, those of us who had hoped that the adoption of the euro would get Greece to go in line, is now taking place in a different way. The discipline of capital markets has been in replaced by the discipline imposed by these lenders. And that, in my judgment, is a very, very positive development. The big issue is, of course, that the uh, politicians in Greece had no pressures to change their way. Because they still face the problem that if one party goes and says, this is what we have to do to get things straight, there will be another party which says, vote for us. These guys are, should be thrown out. Vote for us. And we have all these wonderful, easy solutions. We just put a tax on every swimming pool in Athens, and that will take care of our problems. You know, that kind of stuff. You know? And then, of course, they have their supporters, they have their ideologues, they have their populists who go on the street and demonstrate, and we see it in the papers every day, or we used to see it every day, resistance to what these officials, lenders, would like the Greek government to do. So what has been the solution? Very positive, in my judgment. They got rid of the politicians. Papandreou resigned. Whom did they put in? An economist. <laughs> A technocrat. Someone who, by his own career path, is not interested in being re-elected. Here's a guy who can say, look, this is what we have to do. Politics of old are no longer going to go. We have to do this. It happened not just in Greece. It happened in Italy, and it happened in Portugal. And in my judgment, what we are seeing in Europe, if you want to put a positive spin on it, is a lot of benefits to all Western countries. No Western country, in the light of hitting the wall with the can being kicked down, now being realized, can afford to go on the way they did in the past. And just yesterday, across my desk came an article by Robert Samuelson writing for Newsweek. He says, what we learned in 2011 is what the frustrating and confusing budget debate may never reach a workable solution. It may continue indefinitely until it's abruptly ended by a severe economic or financial crisis that, wrench, that wrenches control from, effect, from elected leaders. Do you hear this? He is saying that we may have to get in the United States what we got in Greece. Wrench the power away from elected leaders. Now, some of you who believe all of us who believe in democracy, <laughs> this is a scary scenario. And I don't know how it's going to end, but here let me continue with what he had to say. We are shifting from giveaway policies 
to take away policies. Since World War II, presidents and congresses have been in the enviable position of distributing more benefits to more people without requiring ever steeper taxes. Now this governing formula no longer works and politicians face the opposite, taking away, reducing benefits or raising taxes significantly to prevent government deficits from destabilizing the economy. Here is, I think, another way of putting, making the point that I made, and both in Canada and the United States, this is the benefit which we may expect. Now, I can't say that the, the problems faced by those technocrats will be overcome, that their ability uh, to deal with the problems uh, allows them to save Greece. But I know one thing, that if they leave the Eurozone and readopt the Drachmi and retain their political system, short Drachmas, because it will continue to fall and the people of Greece will be left behind because of this system whether it works or not. Let me uh, deal with a couple of things that, they, that these technocrats face. The first one is to remember that they have to uh, a bail out, that, uh, that uh, they have to deal with the fact that they have to renew their outstanding debt all the time and add new debt to it. So that uh, is working in a way because the Europeans are helping them. In the process, however, remember, keep a perspective on this. I read a number the other day which is, gives this perspective. The economy, four more minutes, the economy of uh, Greece is equal to that of Greater Miami of Greater Miami in Florida. So in, in a way, that should be manageable. But of course, the unknown is whether or not if they go down, we will get contamination and we get the same thing in Italy and Spain and various other countries. They also face a recession and low tax revenues. Will drastic measures to get the house in order, deregulation, privatization, and all those things that the technocrats will re or have already recommended, will that restore confidence and get people to spend again, investors to make investments, capital to flow to Greece? Who knows? I don't know. We'll see. I have here a couple of other issues which you, you may wish to discuss. I've got only a couple more minutes that are often raised in the context of the discussion of this issue. Why did Greece not simply declare bankruptcy? I, in fact, I raised this in a provocative way with some people at some conference. And the answer is, it, is, it raises so many problems for the economy, for the country, that it is something to be prevented at almost all costs. You know, the United States has Chapter 11 as a law which allows firms that are near bankruptcy to slowly reorganize, try to get profitable, and service their debtors. Ann Kruger, one of the regulars in my conference circuit, proposed when she was an executive director of the IMF that we should have the equivalent of Chapter 11 for countries. It was rejected. So we don't know what happens, but you know, these debtors are like hyenas going after the remnants of a, of a body, and the same thing would happen if Greece declared bankruptcy. The alternative to that is something that a man called Bill Rhodes 
uh, entrepreneur for about 25 or 30 years. He was a head of one of the big American banks, I forget which one. And his job, recorded in this book called Banker to the World, Leadership Lessons from the Front Lines of Global Finance. He spent these years getting together the creditors, the people who have lent money to Brazil, Thailand, Indonesia, uh, Russia, and said, OK, guys, if we have them engage in a disorderly bankruptcy, there will be all these hyenas doing all this damage. It is in your interest, lenders, to get together and accept a certain level of a haircut, a reduction in the nominal amount you're going to get back from the money that you have lent to Greece and others. And one of the big difficulties here in Counter is that hedge funds, numerous hedge funds, many hedge funds, and banks and, and uh, pension funds and so on, all tend to have Greek bonds and Russian bonds and so on. And it was an enormous job to get them all together. And under tremendous pressure, all night sessions, nobody leaves this room until we have an agreement, kind of a story he tells in here. He was able to get it done. Now. We're facing the same thing in Europe. That's the current headlines uh, on Greece. Can we get all the hedge funds to agree? Because all the big borrowers have agreed to accept, I think, what is it, 60%, uh, 70%? You know, it's still under negotiation. And one tricky part of it is that a lot of these bonds are held by uh, the European Central Bank and other official lenders. And they want to be excluded from these haircuts. <laughs> uh, well, I've once read a number saying that if the uh, Greeks insisted on a haircut of 50%, that would wipe out all of the capital of the European Central Bank. And that's a scary scenario. <laughs>